Michael, at the, at the heart of this book is that debate, sometimes that conflict between religion and science, yeah. between evolutionary biology and creationism. I know these have interested you for a long time, these matters. So were you on the hunt for a narrative, for a story which would enable you to investigate them or discuss them? I was. I didn't know it was going to be a novel though. I, I thought it was going to be a, a non-fiction. I thought it was going to be an exploratory uh, he said, she said. And um, I sat down to, to write that and, and, and the first things that ran off the keyboard was not that. It was, was bizarre. It was a, a character and the, and the, the character um, just led the story. And, and so it, just, it was completely led uh, to the extent that I was surprised at what kept coming out. Um, I, I, I didn't expect it. And so uh, sort of eight weeks later there was a novel. <laughs> Um, so you didn't read about the SKA in the papers and think, that's it, that's the vehicle? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. I actually did. I read an, I read an article, and it was an article that said that, uh, that the locals and the, and the, are supporting high science. And, I, and, and that's really what triggered me, just thinking, um, you know, we all grew up in South Africa. We all know small town South Africa. We all understand the, the staunch Calvinist uh, background. And I thought, that's strange and it, and it could be true but mm. but I mm. thought it just makes for such a for such a nice point of departure um, into a book and into a into a discussion it just really um, it, it, the, the SKA the introduction of scientists in one go and money that's following it and and money being pumped into a school and into internets and so forth um, just really uh, accelerates what's already happening across the world uh, in small towns, in, uh, in, in, in small communities, and in isolated uh, tradition. Um, and instead of it taking place over a generation or two and a, and, and a decade or two, it, uh, it's suddenly going to happen in, a, in over weeks. And I said, wow, okay, well, that's, that's I suppose, where the, the novel just, uh, just appeared. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's a modern Galileo story, isn't it? Wow. Okay, it's a modern Galileo story. Yeah, can I? Yeah, can I? Um, but you know, you paint Carnarvon as um, very religious, conservative, racist. Now uh, that might or might not be accurate. Yes. How do yes. they feel about that? <laughs> or have they not yet been introduced uh, to the novel? They possibly haven't been introduced to the novel. You know, it's uh, very much like Dan Brown's uh, treatment of the Catholic Church. I don't know if he went to the mm. Vatican to poll them. Mm. It, it makes for a story. And it just it illustrates a, a good story, and, and I might say that there is resolution in the end, which was surprising to me because I, any novelist, I think, or any writer work, wants to work towards resolution. And as I said, because it wrote itself, I didn't necessarily know what the solution was or the resolution was until the characters had lived out their lives and done their thing. Um, and so, but Carnarvon just happens to be down the road from Oranya. Um, and Aronia, of course, is sort of ground zero for old apartheid state, it's, um, and it's you know it's still got a it's it's a sort of decrees that it's a whites only town. So it did make make for a that, that did make for the for the sort of right environment. And that said, one or two people since uh, with the book said, uh, in fact, the guy who owns a a, a a place up in Loxton said, "Wow, you've you've nailed it. You just got one thing wrong." I, well not, and I'm just paraphrasing him now. He said, "You got one thing wrong." Um, at one point, one of the characters goes down to Loxton and is served uh, in a restaurant by a coloured waitress, and, and, and he's a he's a Indian himself. And the guy says, "You got that wrong because there'd never be a coloured waitress in Loxton." To this day, he said, "There's there would there is no coloured waitress in Loxton." That was his words. I'm paraphrasing him. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. not I'm not verifying it. I'm just saying what he told me. Yeah. And so he said, "Yeah." So you got that wrong. So so actually, it sounded from his perspective and he may be wrong. Okay, so you, I'm glad you don't have to go into Carnarvon heavily disguised. That's good. <laughs> um, why I'm glad is that, that you treated this as a novel yes. is because it deals with very complex um, theory yes. and things that still blow my mind, you know, quantum physics and, and memes and um, uh, quarks and gluons Never in my life I heard of a gluon and the Higgs boson, etc. And it, it bears mentioning that this is not weighty. You, you build lovely little um, snapshots of these issues into your conversations, into the odd speech. Yes. So it's, um, it's very educational, but without feeling as if you're being educated, yes. if, 
if I can say yeah. that. Is that, is yeah. that your uh, intention? And I think maybe the only word that came out of my entire uh, English at school, because somehow I didn't do all that well at English at school, but what came out of it was the word didactic. That means aim to teach. So there was that. Uh, there is that element of where where people and I'm, and the, and the the feedback now is slowly starting to filter back. And only this morning I got one that you know from somebody saying, "Geez, I, I learned so much from it as well. It's meaty. It's got weight. It's not just a, it's not just a happy happy story or sad sad story in some places, but it's got some weight as well." And. Uh, and I thought, uh, so, so, so I achieved something there, I thought. Yeah. And wrapped up in a nice um, yeah. mystery uh, uh, story, um, you know, romance, drama. It's got everything, Michael. So uh -huh. I packed it in. Um, but I learned, I learned so much from the book, um, among, among others, the origin of this phrase, the God particle. Mm. Tell us that. That goddamn particle. Yeah. Uh, well, if you read the media, and I didn't make this up, Google the god particle, and you will find the origins of the particle actually go back to the media, because uh, in and, and uh, I couldn't give you the, the exact date, but there were there were sort of scientists who were calling it that goddamn particle, because my God, it's been almost impossible to find until you know huge investment was put into it, and now the God particle has been found and if, so, so and the media love that, the, the God particle. Yeah, go yeah. So but that it had its origins in the God and part particle was, yeah. was new to me. And the back of the backdrop uh, is our first people, our hunter-gatherers, yes. Sam, Sam Bushman, thank you for including that. Um, and I was fascinating to, to read that um, the evolutionary psychologists believe that we have not yet developed the psychology appropriate to or able to deal with large foreign crowds or large crowds of people. Well, I think we're sort of in that involvement, and and the uh, I think what's what's key here is for hundreds of thousands of generations, not years, generations, we lived in small bands, and those small bands would typically be extended family, would be somebody you'd know your whole life, and occasionally bands would bump into one another, and there'd be some exchange of genes and 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 artifacts and or, 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 or chattel. But um, essentially, we, we are used to dealing with people we know very well, tied mm -hmm. up with them. Mm -hmm. And then in the last few hundred generations, mm -hmm. thousand at the most, um, we've lived, we've been settled down. And it's quite, f just, just on a slight digression here, it's quite funny that we say we, um, we, we domesticated animals and we domesticated wheat. Well, domestic. Dem come from the word domestos, which means house. Well, who lives in a house? Do sheep and mm -hmm. wheat live in a house? No, we do. So uh, they domesticated us um, as an evolutionary trait. They had they just tasted good, and we needed to settle down to look after them. And that, uh, you know, if you we don't want to go too far down that road, but uh, that caused uh, that caused all kinds of n new developments in in our psychology as humans. Um, where we've got to treat, deal with strangers, and and there's there's this friction. We just fundamentally are not wired to deal in sociology the way that we're having to deal, living in communities and so on. Yeah, it's also because is it not? Because the minute we domesticated animals, we started developing a notion of ownership. Yes. This cow is mine. I will create this piece of land to keep it safe, and that is all for, foreign to the to the hunter gatherers. Yeah. That um, materialism, ownership, etc., like um, etc., etc., um, and the and related to that is this notion of a cargo cult mentality. I'd never heard about that, which is how indigenous cultures um, respond to colonialism. Yeah. The first time I ever read that was in a book by a guy called William, William Rees Morgan. It was called The Great Reckoning back in 1995. And he talked about cargo cults, which, as you say, is, is uh, hunter-gatherer societies uh, really view uh, the trappings of Western society that we bring in, the Coca-Colas and the refrigerators and the instant everything. They, they, they see it through, their, through the prism of magic. They, they don't understand a production and process. And uh, the idea of cargo cults, in fact, I think goes back to the 1950s when Australian scientists, anthropologists, first went into sort of Java, into the depths of the, of the jungles and came across these cargo cults and brought them these trappings. And um, at some point, uh, it was generally for land and for prospecting rights, and um, at some point the, the, the hunter-gatherers took some of them uh, hostage and said, okay, we'll send some all that cargo. And, and then they, so eventually they said, well, listen, come with us. And they took the a delegation of leaders back to... Australia, and they showed them how processes work, how we produce the coke and how we produce these things. It's not magic. 
and when they were done, they said, "Okay, but now show us the magic." <laughs> so yeah. uh, it's just yeah. it's just this prism of of their reality. Yeah. Um, the book's been out long enough for you to be able to gauge responses to um, what is potentially very annoying or irritating mm -hmm. for groups like the Young Creationists. So, where are what do they say about this? That said. You know, um, at this point in time, it is self-published, and um, I, I'm yeah, for that, for, I, <laughs> I'm looking for, I, of course, looking for agents and so forth. But I'm impatient. I'm not. I don't want to wait six months while I find a New York agent. I don't want to make wait another year to get a publisher. I want to do it, so I'm doing yeah. it. Um, and people only buy it when they know about it, and uh, you know, their, their budget's involved. So I've got a few hundred people read it at this stage, and of those, I've had a duomini, a preacher, read it, and he loved it. Um, I've had uh, several people who've grown up in the in the NGK read it. In fact, assisted me all along to make sure I was on track with it. And um, on Amazon, I just recently got a young Earth. He describes himself as a young Earth creationist. He believes literally in talking snakes. Uh, he, he believes in in uh, Adam and Eve literal translation. You know, six thousand years ago, the Earth was made in six days. He literally believes that. And he said he had a lot of resistance um, starting out. He just he just didn't want to even pick it up. Um, but he, the more he got into it, and at the end of it, he just said he was. Uh, he said, "Tell anybody who is religious who thinks you're attacking religion to go away um, with mm. an F." Mm. Uh, he said that because he said it's it's a, it's an honest um, uh, challenge, and um, you know, and it deserves to be debated, not uh, you know, not not shunned. Entirely so I was I was. I was pleased, I was quite taken aback by it because yeah. I didn't think it would be that well received. And the scientists, and particularly those involved in the SKA, have you reached them yet? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't know. No. I don't know. You know, um, at, at the end of that, you don't want to write a book that that uh, that you're inaccurate with or mm. uh, that can be challenged, fundamentally challenged.